Good evening, everybody. It is so great to see all of you. Um, we have so many people here uh, this evening. I know people joining us from all around the UK and from Germany. Um, so fantastic to see you. Please share in the chat um, where you're joining us from this evening. My name is Hannah Vaughan Spruce. I'm the Director of Divine Renovation UK. And it's such a joy to gather with so many people from all around the country and even um, from Germany as well. Um, Divine Renovation is the Catholic ministry. We inspire, connect and equip parishes to become missional and through them to bring many people to Jesus Christ. Um, so if we are new to you, um, you are very, very welcome. Um, over the last two years, we've seen so many parishes um, get involved um, in some of the work that Divine Renovation is doing and changing the way that they're approaching mission and leadership. And Divine Renovation isn't a program, it's not a specific set of things to implement in your parish. Rather, it's about three keys and three principles of renewal. And parishes all over the UK are starting to implement these three keys. So very briefly, the three keys are Firstly, the power of the Holy Spirit, because without the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing can change in our parishes. We won't see renewal. Um, secondly, the, the priority of evangelization. So that the most important thing that our parishes do is to reach out to the person who doesn't yet know Jesus. And then thirdly, the best of leadership principles. So really through our leadership, how to release and unleash all the gifts of people in our parishes so that together we can make a huge impact in, in bringing people um, to know Jesus. So if this sounds a little bit like a parish that you would like to aspire to be, we have so many ways that we would love to come alongside you to equip you um, through coaching and other offerings. And um, we'll share a little bit more about those um, at the end of the webinar. Um, there's all kinds of ways that we would love to come and support you. So today um, we're gathering to talk about confirmation preparation and I'm really delighted to introduce two guests who are going to be speaking about this um, together with me um, this evening. Both of them aren't new to this webinar. So Georgia Clark um, is a youth minister at St. Elizabeth's Parish in Richmond. And Georgia, welcome, um, Georgia joined us for the last webinar that we did as well on First Communion. So big welcome to you, Georgia. Thanks so much, Hannah. It's such a pleasure to be back and particularly for this topic because I'm so passionate about it. Awesome. We, we're really excited about this topic and I know um, our other guest is super excited about it as well. Matt Reggett, um, who is also a familiar face around here, is a leadership coach with Divine Renovation joining us from Texas. Welcome, Matt. Welcome, Matt. I always laugh when I hear those two words together. So it's it's good to be here, even if I'm being stepped on. So. <laughs> Great. So excited for today. Um, before we get into talking about a little bit of an introduction to this topic, we'd love to just start in prayer. So I'm going to ask Georgia if you would if you would lead us in prayer. Thank yes, you. of course. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you are here and we are surrounded by your loving presence. Please open our hearts and minds to receive any words that you want to give us this evening, any movements uh, that we, you want to see happen in our parishes. Help us to be attentive and to be surprised by hope through the words that are spoken and as they're heard. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Please bless the technology and all those present, and particularly those young people who are currently preparing for confirmation in all the parishes that are represented across the globe today. Lord, we thank you. We ask for your blessing. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Georgia. And I just love that, you know, we're praying for the young people because I think this is what's motivating every single person to be here tonight, just our love for and our, you know, desire for young people to come and know Jesus. Um, so January was um, part one of this series. So many of us gathered um, to speak about First Communion um, and what First Communion preparation could look like if we did that differently in our parishes. And it really kind of inspired um, so many people thinking um, how, how they want to do things differently 
Um, and we know that sacramental preparation really is the elephant in the room for many parishes. And I think we're not going to kind of tiptoe around this topic in, in this webinar. We, we're really going to say it how we think it is, which is that, you know, often it can be even um, self-destructive or detrimental to our parishes to keep programmes going in the same ways that we've been doing it for, for decades. Um, and yet we're acknowledging how hard it is to break out of that cycle, to break out of the system of, of this programmatic approach. Um, so in back in January, we talked about how um, a new approach to a, a whole family centered ministry towards children can bear so much more fruit rather than just a one size fits all programmatic approach to First Communion. And I think this evening we really want to um, talk about how we apply those principles to young people and confirmation. Um, how do we really prioritize making disciples of young people rather than just sacramentalizing them? Um, so before we get into this, because I know we've got so much to say, such a passionate topic, um, we're going to invite you to take part in a poll. It's going to come up on your screen in a moment. We want to hear from you and hear um, how you currently do confirmation preparation in your parish. Um, so there are going to be four options. You can see them in front of you now, and I'd love you to just um, choose which is the option that happens in your parish right now. So do you run a program with just the candidates? Do you run a program that involves parents in some way as well? Do you um, have an ongoing youth ministry rather than an age-based confirmation program? Or perhaps you don't currently have any com confirmation preparation going on at the moment. So choose your option. And um, in a moment, we'll see um, the results of, of that poll, because that's going to be um, great just to inform us of, of where what our starting point is, where what most people are what me, most people are doing right now. And just as we get um, into the into the conversation, you'll see at the bottom of your screen there is a Q and A button, and we would love you if you have questions for our panelists during this webinar, please pop them into the Q and A. Um, because this is the way that we can see them and, we, and we, we're going to have time towards the end of this webinar where we're going to answer as many questions as, as we can. Um, so put your questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat, but please keep, um, keep your comments going in the chat as well because we love your feedback there is great and often there's some fantastic ideas that people can share in there as well. Um, so we're going to close the poll and perhaps um, share the results if that's possible. Um, and this will come up on your screen too. So 65%, so the vast majority are running a program um, with just the candidates right now. So by a program, I guess we're, we're talking about something that has a beginning and an end. 24% um, include the parents in some way. Um, just 3% are, are running an ongoing youth ministry. So they don't have an age-based confirmation program. So that's amazing. I would if, if you're in that 3%, please share in the chat because we would love to hear from you because this is so novel. And 9% um, are saying they don't have confirmation preparation. So great to see, um, you know, just take a bit of a temperature check on that and see where everybody is at. Um, but I would love Matt to jump into it to a kind of big picture question, which is um, why should we stop this programmatic approach? Like why should we stop running confirmation programs I know that's a really bold question just to jump right in with but I know I know you want to speak to this so over to you <laughs> yeah thanks Hannah so you notice why they invite me on they <laughs> want to ask that question and then at the end of it all the hate mail goes to Hannah she'll just direct it to me yeah uh, but what I do notice you know Hannah that, that we we have this topic we kind of saw it coming because right Georgia was on the call last time when we talked about sacramental prep for uh, first communion and this one has like 200 people that have, we have like over 500 sign up for this. So we realized, first of all, if everyone was super happy with the way this was going, they wouldn't have signed up. And so we know by your attendance here that you either absolutely love what you're doing and you can't wait to share with us all of your wisdom about what you're doing, or you've had enough. And I, for one, have had enough. I was a youth minister for 20 years, first of all, before I was ever a, a coach, I got into parish ministry as a youth minister. I grew up through a youth program. I went through the confirmation process at a big parish. I became that youth minister at that parish for 20 years. 
And here's the irony. I've seen thousands of teenagers go through confirmation. But tonight, my oldest son, Athen, receives his confirmation. I did not plan it this way. We did not pick it because it was Athens confirmation. But I do want everyone to say a special prayer for my son, Athen, tonight as we prayed for all those that are receiving confirmation. Because at my parish, there's hundreds being confirmed tonight. It's a big place. But when we look at this, when we see the numbers of kids that come back, when we see the way people treat confirmation as graduation from Catholic formation, I mean, we've positioned it that way by, by building a school model, by putting them in classrooms, by calling them teachers, by giving them books, lessons, homework, requirements. Is this sounding a little like school? And we're wondering why they're not inspired. So first of all, I would say why, to answer your question, why do we stop doing it this way? First, I'm gonna tell you, you shouldn't if you're happy with the results. So if you like the statistics, if you like what we're turning out, if you like what your program is doing, then keep doing it. But again, if this is how many people are showing up because they're probably somewhat unhappy or absolutely fed up, then enough's enough. I was a youth minister for 20 years, and I know in a minute we're going to talk about some of those changes that we got to make. But my big reason for the change is Let's look at what we're turning out. And I don't just mean at your parish, but if we look at the demographic of young adults, they are the lowest mass attending demographic that there is. And in my country, Texas, I mean the US, it's below 20%. I don't think the UK is faring better than that. So if that's the lowest attending mass demographic, and we would say that what we would hope from a confirmation program is that we churn out lifelong Catholics, then it's not working because they're the lowest demographic of mass attendees. And it's only going down from there. I would also say that we know the ingredients for what works. We just haven't figured out yet how to put those ingredients into some sort of repeatable or dare I say programmatic way that can be sustained by a parish. So I'm glad we're having this conversation, but if you came today to get the magic bullet or George is gonna tell you the program that worked for her and you're just gonna go adopt that, you're probably going to be disappointed because it's bigger, like you said, divine renovation is not a program. Formation for sacraments is not, it can't be a program either. We've got to get out of the programmatic mindset. We have to be about inspiring and not requiring. Inspiring says it's about a relationship. Requiring says it's transactional. And I think the transactions need to end. Thank you so much, Matt. Seriously, inspiring, not requiring. I absolutely love it. This is an evangelistic approach, primarily before a catechetical one. Thank you. Um, and Georgia, just going to you as well, I'd love to hear a little bit about how, about why you changed your approach at St. Elizabeth's Richmond, because I know that when you, when you started this job as director of youth ministry, you said to, to Father Stephen, your parish priest, I'm not going to run a, a confirmation program, which is such a bold thing for the youth ministry person to say, right, when they start a new job. So say a little bit about why and, and how and, and why you've changed the approach. Well, it's it's kind of ironic because I am kind of going against the grain in that my confirmation was the turning point for me. I wasn't practicing before then. Uh, and then after confirmation, I decided that I wanted to be a disciple and I wanted to be a an active member of the church. However, it probably wasn't the confirmation program that made me want to do that. And, I, and I'd like to ask everyone who's on the call just to think to themselves, who was it that was instrumental in a, you being here, you having the faith that you have, you being passionate about this type of uh, preparation? Because there will be few key people who probably journeyed with you in a very intentional way. And it's just the, the fact that the confirmation programs don't set up that kind of individualized approach. So yes, when I got the when I said to Father Stephen, I'd love to be the youth minister at the parish, I said, but I'm not doing the program because I had gone to other parishes and given one-off sessions, I'd helped with other sessions. 
And you, you see the same thing again and again. At the end of the program, the young people are not missionary disciples. They're, they're simply not. And that's what we want to see. I wanted to have a, a new vision. It's not enough for me to just have a 20 to 30. I mean, it's impressive that in your parish, Matt, there's hundreds, but I think I would struggle to find a parish perhaps in the UK that had quite so many. So it's usually about 20 to 30. I didn't want to just see them. Oh, I hope they've got a generally good impression of the church. That's not good enough for me. I wanted them to be on fire, ready to use the gifts that they would receive at confirmation to serve the church and their local community. So that was the vision. And I wasn't actually sure exactly how I was going to go about it. And so I've just been experimenting with different formats and changing things as we've been going along. Uh, and I suppose that's also one thing I wanted to emphasize is I'm in the second year of it now and I'm changing things already because some things worked and some things didn't. But it's a question for everybody here. If you're running the same program that you have run for five plus years, and it's sort of unsurprisingly showing the same results, you know, please, please stop. If not for your sake, because what we're seeing is that because these programs are ineffective, those who are leading those programs are feeling burnt out, they're stressed, they're feeling disheartened by the whole process as well. So just know that there is a lot of hope and that there is another way to do things uh, that isn't just putting on a set number of classes and hoping that they graduate with a deep desire in their hearts because it's just not what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. I think, do you know what? I, I think everyone here probably agrees. Things need to change. That's exactly why we're here. We're, we're all agree, ag agreed that, that what we're doing currently doesn't work. So we'd love to just move to the question of, well, what do we do? Like, what's, what is the thing that we do differently? Um, so, and I think this is what people are here for probably to hear, what do we do differently? Um, so Matt, can you share a little bit about what, what did this look like at your parish? Like what model did you move towards or perhaps other parishes that you coach now? What are you seeing that they're doing? What are some new trends? Right. So as a youth minister for many years, you know, we went through the transactional model. It's what the diocese, you know, would ask us to do. It's what was done at the parish for many years. It's what parents had experienced. And it just, although all of the disappointment with having to do this, it's like it was the accepted model. It was the average model because everybody did it. And then we see the results as Catholics aren't remaining Catholic after, you know, they go off to college because they've received graduation. We realized we wanted to try something different. And we had the foresight because we had a lot of years of experience. Now, I know a lot of youth ministers, right? They're volunteers or they just love the, you know, the church enough to do what they can. So God bless all of you out there that are just like holding it together uh, at your parish or volunteering the little bit of time you have, because most of this is on the backs of volunteers. But we've built up this administrative system, this juggernaut that we can't support, which is we track attendance, we have registrations, we, you know, put them in, we, we have all of this administrative stuff. And by the way, I realize there's going to be some administrative challenges, but to get out from beneath that, to let the mission drive, not the administration. And to do that, we, we were at my parish, we said, okay, enough's enough. I was pretty much burned out as a youth minister. Imagine after all these years of doing the same thing and seeing the same results. I know a lot of you feel burned out, like you want to throw your hands up. We just decided that was the last year we were going to do that. But we didn't know what we were going to do. And so we went, we sat at a pub with a couple of youth ministers and we said, we're not leaving here, which was maybe not the best idea. We're not leaving here until we have decided what it's going to look like. Because there was nothing off the shelf. There was no publisher that was doing it. There weren't even a lot of parishes that were trying anything new. And we sat there and we realized that the minute we undid the whole process we had been working under, it was going to affect other things too, right? It was going to affect um, family 
uh, structure. It was going to affect uh, even the liturgies that we had. It was going to affect our retreats. It was going to affect how we did little kid formation for the other sacraments. It's like a domino effect that we can't just change this one thing and leave everything else the same. And that was what scared us the most. So we had to get other people on board to say it's enough. Enough's enough. So we came into it, said, we're going to do it differently. We drew up a plan. We went from an every Sunday night model during the school year. So it was like 26 hour long sessions across a year. We went from that to a four time a year on Saturday, all day conference style experience, because you realized we could teach people the faith and then they wouldn't love it any more than teaching someone math makes them love math or we could help them have an encounter of faith and learn in the process. It was putting evangelization before catechesis. It doesn't mean one without the other, because that tends to be where people lose their minds over this, is by saying evangelization, that didn't mean that catechesis isn't important. But evangelization has to drive catechesis. There is a reason that other denominations, other churches love former Catholics so much. It's because when they go into their church, they're already wired. The Catholic Church did its job and taught them all the things. But you know what the Catholic Church forgot to do? Turn their light switch on. And so they walk into these other churches and other churches know how to turn light switches on, help them have an encounter of faith. And then the teenager or the young person or the adult that's been wired their whole life and never had an encounter of faith walks in and says, oh my gosh, look how all of this works. And we need people in our churches that are willing to create light switch moments for teenagers, not teachers. Pope Paul VI said in Evangeli Nuntiandi 40 years ago, he said, people will listen to us because we are witnesses. And if we're also teachers, then they're gonna listen to us because we're first witnesses. We need to be witnesses of faith, be about encounters of faith. There's a reason things like retreats still work, small groups, family gatherings. We need to create light switch moments for kids and get them out of a classroom setting and make evangelization the leader of catechesis. Mm. So much good stuff there, Matt. Thank you. Like two big things I'm taking from what you've said. Are, are firstly, um, you know, this isn't just about shifting a model for one program in the parish, as you say, like this is interconnected with the parish as a whole. And often we talk about, you know, what resources do we need? What are the tools we need? Um, and really, it's so much deeper than that, because it means, you know, a whole missionary kind of renewal for every layer of the parish you know so this changes everything about how we lead um, and this is what we do in divine renovation we come alongside parishes that really want to go deeper and change culture and change structure and change leadership um within within the parish and this enables you know us to be able to change the confirmation um thing as well and then yeah just just the um just that emphasis on encounter oh my goodness like uh this this is the most important thing to kind of create those um to create create those um situations where young people can encounter jesus so i love it um georgia what would you share as well about saint elizabeth's like what are you doing differently what does your model look like now yeah, thanks, Hannah. And echo everything Matt just said. I, when I was thinking about this particular webinar, I just wrote down, we need to stop emphasizing the need for catechists and look for the evangelists, look for those who are really gifted in communicating the faith and just light up when they see somebody encounter God for the first time or encounter Christ for the first time. And we cannot assume that a single young person has had that encounter when they come through our doors, even if they have been coming for years and years. And I said that in one of our first confirmation sessions, I said, guys, I'm not assuming that you even believe in God at this point. And they all kind of went, I can't believe she just said that. Uh, but a lot of them looked very visibly relieved that I was just kind of stating the obvious. I said, but I'm, I'm here. We're going to go through this together and I will work with you personally to get you where you want your faith to be. And that's really what I'd say is that it's a very individualized approach that we're taking in the parish. So we don't have a, a program that starts and finishes. Uh, we have a 
weekly youth group that runs all year long and it's for anybody in secondary school so they can come along and at different points of the year we do different things like youth alpha which i found is an excellent tool just to make sure everyone's up to the same um up to the same pace and the small group aspect of that works really well emphasizing that point again that matt made small groups really do work and then we have a couple of socials per month and what i found is that that aspect really improves the community feel and the relationships between the young people once they know each other and they trust one another to open up and to be honest about what how prayer's going to be honest about how they find the mass uh, whether they find the time to pray during the week, then we see real movements and real shifts happen. So I do a games night and an adventure social offsite, uh, both of those once a month. And I put an emphasis also on invitations so they know that they are to invite their friends to those events because once they see the uh, invitational aspect of what it means to be a disciple, I'm finding that I've got new people in there every week and they know that the environment is set up that when new people come along, they're welcomed wholeheartedly. And that makes me really happy to see. So the youth group keeps going. Then we have some confirmation focused retreats just to prepare those who would like to do their confirmation. And I'm really careful about the language that I use about confirmation. I say, if you're thinking about doing it this year, there's no pressure, but come to one of the retreats and I offer a couple just so that everybody has a chance to go on one. They're, they're very often in, incredibly formative for the young people because what happens is that they make their faith their own. It comes outside of any kind of classroom setting, especially if that's what it seems to be set up as in the parish. And we just kind of do life together for a few days. And then they go, oh, okay, I could do this at home. I can say morning prayer at home and I, can learn how to say the rosary because I've actually sat down for half an hour with somebody one on one and learned how to do it. So a couple of retreats and then post confirmation, uh, we've started doing something called the ascent, which is a more intentional discipleship program. It's three years. It has been running for, uh, I think, something like eight or nine years already. But St. Elizabeth's, I had this idea about what young young people's formation would look like and someone said that sounds a lot like the ascent have you given it a go so i contacted them and we are the first parish location we're coming to the end of our first year as the first parish running the sessions in person and those young people are blowing my mind i can't believe i'm their youth minister i feel like it should be the other way around and they're starting to help me lead youth group they are stepping up into leadership positions in the parish so doing music, helping on hospitality, helping with writing for our newsletters. It's just amazing to watch actually, but that's all happening because they had the encounter before confirmation. They then were in com conversation with me about whether they felt that they were ready for confirmation. And so I had a small group of them because it was pandemic time. I think that gave us a real opportunity to kind of start again. And I had a group, small group who did their confirmation at the end of August last year, and every single one of those young people were back at youth group the next Monday. And they all of them have gone on to do an intentional discipleship program afterwards. And so I thought, well, this seems to be the way to go. And they are communicating it with me, at least that they're loving it and their families also being transformed by it. So um, I'm not really sure I'm just leaving the Holy Spirit to do his thing, but it's it seems to be working. And I'm really excited by that. Wow. This is just music to our ears, isn't it? Because this is what we all dream of and hope for and probably think this is this is not possible, but you're doing it and you're showing that it can be done. Um, you know, that young people can be evangelized before they're confirmed. And I think, I, I love what you're saying about, you know, young people themselves um, being aware of their readiness, you know, and, and coming forward and saying, yeah, I think I'm ready. Um, it's not dependent on age. And I know there's been a few questions there in Q&A about readiness and age and all of that kind of thing. But for young people to say, yes, I feel like now's, now's the time. That's just so beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Georgia, what happens when um, you might have a family or a teenager come to the parish who isn't part of the youth ministry, part mm -hmm. of the youth group, and they say, okay, we want our kid to be confirmed this year. 
Um, what do you say as a parish? So there's, it's not that I've got a set list of requirements. So I've had a few families come and say, um, oh, well, so-and-so can't come to these retreats. They can't make these sessions. And I think, well, actually, if they're being formed at home, um, then fantastic. I'm not, I want your young person to be confirmed. I don't want to be like the gatekeeper for the sacraments. Yeah. And I think they think that I am, that they need to sort of wrestle with me to get their child confirmed. I'm thinking absolutely not. That's what I want. But I do need to see evidence that, that they want it, first of all, that it, their faith is their own, is the second thing I say, and that there is evidence of key formation. And so I say, I'm happy to work with you personally. And that's another thing I, I didn't mention before is that I offer mentoring to the youth group. Now I can only mentor so many, uh, that's why you do need to train up other mentors to be journeying intentionally with these young people, but it makes a huge difference. So if a family come and say, let's say now, and they say, oh, confirmation's in June, can my child be confirmed? I, I will say, let me have a chat with them. Let me sit down and see where they're at. Let them come to youth group, come on the retreats, make friends. And if they grow in autonomy in their faith, and we see evidence of that, then let's say at the end of May, we'll see where they're at. But I just say, it's, it's actually not a problem. There's not a set date that they have to be ready by. Mm -hmm. If they're not ready in June, let's yeah. talk about later in the year, we can ask for permission to confirm yeah. and we'll make it even more special celebration. But I, I do emphasize the fact that they need to be ready. Um, it needs to be um, a whole family decision, but most importantly, that young person who is willing to use the gifts that they'll be given. Yeah, absolutely. I love the authenticity of, of, of your approach, you know, to have these open and real conversations with families and to talk about readiness, you know, we're not kind of avoiding these issues, I, I just think that's lovely, and just bringing them, bringing them into the journey and saying like, we're walking with you, we want to support you, we're, mm -hmm. we're accompanying you, we're not making you jump through hoops, um, it's beautiful, so thank you so much. Um, Matt, what about the kind of how question? Like, you know, there are parishes here thinking, okay, we really need to start moving towards this. And this is a big thing, as you say, this is gonna affect not just one program, this is gonna have a knock-on effect in lots of different areas of the parish. Like, how on earth do you start tackling this? What are the steps you, you take? <laughs> you know, you mentioned at the beginning, the elephant in the room, I think we've named the elephant. Mm -hmm. Now it's about eating the elephant, right? Which is yeah. one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, which still sounds disgusting to me. But anyways, I think if we're gonna get serious about like just next steps, how do we prioritize a few of those? See, for us, we realized at a big parish, at a big program, we couldn't just make an incremental change. And that's the tendency. Well, how about we do this? Or, well, for this group of kids, we'll offer this. And for this group, we'll still do the same old thing. Well, how about we don't make them come 24 weeks, we'll make them come 20 and then we'll do a retreat. Like we're so ready, like we're holding on to something that never has shown fruit in the last few years or is, is not showing the fruit we wished it would. And we're holding on for maybe the, because we're afraid of losing our jobs or we just don't know there's another way. So I would say the first thing you gotta do is decide, is this gonna be a wholesale change? And if so, who needs to be involved? Who are the people that can help you pull this off? There's other families that, that abhor this process as well. They dislike it greatly. We can get them involved. You have other parents of kids in the program. They have a vested interest. Let's start with them. And some things to prioritize. Because see, these are the two ingredients that this small age demographic of mass goers as young adults have probably missed. Because see, public school kids, private school kids, homeschooled kids, kids that have gone to church, kids that have gotten confirmed, they all leave the church at the same rate. But these two ingredients, these two indicators show much better improvement for staying lifelong believers and, and followers of the Catholic Church. That is the faith of the family, specifically dads out there. They, they carry a lot of weight in this. Secondly, is involved in a youth community, a youth group. Now, I know a lot of the churches in the UK might not have youth groups, but what if you started to prioritize gathering teenagers together on a regular basis without the intention of teaching them stuff? I just want that to sit there for a minute. 
This is dinner at your house. This is praying together. This is authentic friendship. This is really what small group looks like. We don't need to equate small group with classroom. These happen very naturally on retreats. We built in an entire small group system into our big Saturday model. We met four times a year. That was just for the like preparation things. We turned these Saturdays into, we had small groups, we had fun, we would bring in uh, engaging speakers. Sorry, every mom and dad that wants to share that might not be able to hold a teenager's attention. We brought in engaging speakers. We brought in powerful worship opportunities, sacramental um, uh, Eucharistic adoration. We brought in mass. We brought in games and fun and a whole day like this. And by, by golly, at the end of the day, they actually learned some things. It wasn't like a sneak attack. It was we led with evangelization. We led with a place that people wanted to be and to be part of. Once they're there and they've committed, you can teach them all day long. So what if we made our first steps about creating a more evangelization-driven model? Small groups, gather in people's homes, find people that'll buy pizza for the kids if you don't have a budget for it. Take them on a retreat. Engage them with other families. Gather in people's homes if you can. And I would say take some of those initial steps and then decide, and then decide how important it is that they meet every one of these requirements that you already have set up? And are there maybe a few other requirements that we're missing? Because earlier somebody was asking, how do you judge readiness? Well, Georgia just gave you a plan for that. How about readiness as I have a conversation with you and see how serious about your faith you are? Just because it's hard to measure doesn't mean we can't measure it. We just might not have thought of it yet. So let's start praying into how we can make readiness more important and relationship more important than transaction. Yeah, I love I love what you're saying about relationships and friendships, because at the end of the day, that's what's going to keep young people engaged and connected. Right. Um, and so leading with that stuff, you know, we can think about what resources are we using? What what this and what that? But at the end of the day, oh, my goodness, like let's prioritize relationships, friendships, building fun, all, all of that stuff. Um, Georgia, what about you? What would you say is the first step um, for parishes to, to move towards this new model, new approach? I think the first step is to be realistic and courageous in looking at your landscape and being really honest about its efficacy. So let's be honest, how many of these young people are we seeing at mass every week? Because if they're being confirmed, that's a huge part of it, that they are agreeing to go to mass and hopefully to be part of the community. Do you have visible witnesses within your parish community? Are they on the doors welcoming people? Are they part of the music team? Are they helping you with their live streams? Because they're really good at that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, so uh, are, they, are they visible witnesses in your parish or not? So just be realistic and then courageous to say, yeah, this isn't working or perhaps we don't have enough people, who else can you ask? And then I'd say, there are lots of really good resources out there just to get you started. I, I, when I first started, Father Stephen gave me this book and I reread it again after the first year and it just made so much sense. So it's called The Art of Forming Young Disciples uh, by Everett Fritz, would really recommend that book. It's honest, it's why youth ministries aren't working and what to do about it. Um, so if you'd like to follow up from this webinar, I think this is a good book to start with. And then I'd say start developing and training mentors. Ideally, I'd say young adults, but it doesn't have to be. Young people just really desire an adult to pay attention to them. And I've got the particular context of London. Life is incredibly busy. They don't often have a lot of one-to-one -one time of somebody just saying, I care. Like, how is your faith going? What help do you need? And so I, when I say mentoring, I, I, we do it once a month, but it makes a huge difference with these young people. It could be for 45 minutes, just meeting up, going outside of the church for a hot chocolate. Uh, parents obviously informed, they know everything that's happening. They're happy with it. But mentoring is a, is a big shift and uh, 
I'd say have small groups. When I started, I started during the pandemic um, because Father Stephen said, these young people are missing out on a huge amount of community and relationship. And, and it is key to say, like really key, that relational ministry is what is working. It's all about relationship. Yeah. And so anyway, I, met, I did a Zoom call and about four or five of them were coming every week, which feels very small. And then week on week, there was like one or two more, one or two more. Uh, and, but actually those five or six are now helping me run the youth group. And it's not been that long ago. Somebody said to me when I was first thinking about like the vision and strategy for youth ministry, don't underestimate uh, sorry, don't overestimate what you can do in one year, but don't underestimate what you can do in three. And it's so true. Mm-hmm. So be clear on your vision. What do you want to see? Get a little team together who understand that vision and are going to run with you with it. And this is definitely one more than one step, Hannah. So I apologize. But here are a few steps to get you going. Uh, and and Very mentors, great. I'd say get a few mentors together who, who would be willing to just meet with a young person and, and journey with them. Brilliant. So good. So good. I love that you're, you're saying on all of this, uh, it's so, so brilliant. You're not saying just use this program and this is going <laughs> to, you're saying, you know, that it's a so much big, it's such a bigger picture than that. Um, I'd love to come to some of the questions because we've got some fantastic questions here and maybe I'll throw this first one to Georgia Um, you know people are asking about um, you know obviously you're a, you're a, a paid member of staff at, in, in the parish in Richmond and um, that's very unusual over here like the, the the vast majority of parishes would not have a paid youth minister and um, what what advice do you have for a parish that doesn't have someone like you who's dedicated to this i would say you do need to appoint someone who's going to lead it um, yeah. who's just going to be committed it, it could be an hour a week my team i think put in more volunteer hours by themselves than i'm not going to say than me because obviously i do a lot of the admin stuff but it it they put in so many volunteer hours and they have busy jobs so it's not impossible you just need someone who's going to take the lead, who understands the vision and who's going to rally a team. And you might have heard this acronym of like fact people. So those who are faithful, um, is it attentive and contagious? Available. Available. Available, contagious and teachable. You're really looking for those people uh, who are going to really rally a team around them and get something going. And it, like I said, it could be for one hour a week or every other week, start and fortnightly. It's better than doing a, it's better than doing a class every single week that the young people don't look forward to. Do something fortnightly that they do look forward to or monthly, a day monthly that they love after mass. I'm sure that there are a few people who would be happy to say, yeah, I can give a couple of hours and it will transform their lives. Absolutely. I think, you know, so much of this follows vision, right? When people hear a vision, like this is what we want to do for, for, for young people in our parish. They're like, yes, I'm going to give my evenings and weekends to this. I'm going to make this happen, even though I've got a busy job, whatever. Um, so I think, you know, when there's vision, when people are inspired, um, they're just they're just up for it, you know, regardless of what else they've got, they've got going on. Um, and sorry, this isn't. This is m- more questions for you, Georgia. People are really interested on your social nights and adventure events. They sound great. I want to come to your adventure event. Can you say more about that. Yeah, they are. They are really fun. So, like tomorrow night, we've got a games night. And the young people are in- encouraged to bring their favorite games from home as well. So we'll just play like articulate, or we've had some really cool kind of backgammon games, uh, and. People have homemade games that they also bring along. That's super fun. But I, yeah, we, we just hang out together basically. And then on the adventure socials, we've done things like escape rooms, mini golf. I've booked paintballing, but if I'm honest, I can't say that I'm personally looking forward to that one. I've put it off until the summer because I said, you're just not shooting me when it's this cold, but it's, it's looming. But they're, they're the kinds of things that we do. It's just, it's just to get off site once a month, uh, spend some time together and we meet after mass for that one so they're all expected to come to mass and then we head out together love it so good um 
Matt, could you say a little, there's been a few questions about readiness. Like, can you say a little bit about that? I'm thinking about, um, I know one of the things that, you know, Sh Sherry Waddell talks about is like having a threshold conversation with someone mm -hmm. where you really kind of gauge, you know, where, where are they in terms of their openness to a relationship with God? I just wonder whether you could kind of say a little bit more about how we can gauge someone's readiness in a one-to-one -one conversation like that. Yeah, and I do, while I'm thinking about it, in case I forget, want to recommend another book. And this book was really the linchpin for us. We had seen the numbers. We were dissatisfied with what we were doing. We wanted to make a change. And this book was kind of the linchpin to say, okay, we're just going to jump out and do it. It's called Engaging a New Generation by my friend Frank Mercadante. So I know they'll post that at some point, but I just wanted to put that book out there. If you want to just read some more on like teen culture and what's working and not working and why some of the biggest questions a teenager asks are not theological. They're actually so what and who cares? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what and who cares? So they better get the answer that we care before we try and teach them things and they don't care what we say. Yeah. So readiness is less about like, See, when we hear readiness, we still put on our Catholic minds and say readiness means answer these. What are the Ten Commandments? What are the seven sacraments? Like, that's what we still judge readiness as. It's this like borrowed from the classroom model. If you're borrowing it from the classroom, I would challenge you to think that there might be another way to look at that. So if readiness is still like an aptitude test, then that's not the kind of readiness. We're talking about spiritual readiness which does have to take place in a conversation. It also has something to do with family participation, family readiness. That's the thing that my parish is now starting to wrestle with. How do we involve the families in this process? Because even though the statistics on a lot of young adults and teenagers is grim, here's the one that's still surprising, that the parent, not Siri or Alexa, the parent is still the most influential person in a kid's life, their parents. And then parents, that shocks most parents, but it's like to the tune of 80% of teenagers say their parents are the most influential people in their lives. Mm -hmm. So they might put on a face that they don't want to be around you, but I would say family readiness has to play into this. Is the family ready to support the kid or the teenager on this journey? Family involvement. Parents can get involved in these processes. It doesn't mean that it just needs to be the young adults running this for teenagers and the parents need to get lost. Parents are the most influential people in their kids' lives still today. So readiness can be judged, um, but it's less about an aptitude and more about let's get into the conversation and see if they want this. So here's, here's two words. Let me give you these two words instead. How about instead of readiness, you start judging desire and capacity? Hmm. Do they have a desire? Because see, desires, desires say a lot, like I, I want this. Capacity says now's the right time and I can do this. So let's demystify readiness, desire, and capacity. Let's have those conversations. Love it. So good. So good. So much to think about here. Um, and I know there are still so many questions um, in the chat. And I think questions that we don't get to answer. Um, and there, is, there are some great ones. Um, I might, I haven't asked Georgia and Matt about this, but I might ask, send some to you so we can we can um, send answers back to you um, afterwards as well if people want to, to follow up. There's also questions about ages as well. And I know that there are different dioceses in the UK that confirm at different ages. And obviously what we're really talking about here is a focus on teenagers, right? Which is which is the age, Georgia, that you have. But I know that there are other dioceses where, where um, children are confirmed um, much younger as well, where obviously you need a completely different approach again. Um, so so thank you for that. Um, I think um, I can see Georgia, you're you're typing answers there as well, which is which is great. We're going to. Um, we're going to move into some of our announcements now because I think um, we've got some great things coming up that we just want to share um, that we want to share with you. And so um, this is um, uh, we would love to hear um, about your about your stories. So I know that um, I know that many people are starting to do things differently in, in, in their parishes. 
And um, if, if you're starting to do something differently with regards to sacramental preparation or anything else, I think a few people have shared there in the chat. Um, we want to hear from you, so please um, email us there. You can see the um, you can see the the address where you can email us. Share share with us your stories because um, we would love to follow up with you and, and hear some more, so we can spread the good news about that. We've also got a fantastic new resource and. Um, Matt shared that, you know, when you start looking at changing a program, this has a knock on effect for the whole parish. And so this is why we exist at Divine Renovation is to help you think these things through. And so we would love to share with you this wonderful new free resource. It's online, divinerenovation.org slash keys. And this is a resource that will introduce you and, and a few of the parishioners in your parish um, to exploring the three keys of Divine Renovation to unlocking your parish. There's some video um, stuff there as a study guide, and you can download all of that for free from our website. So that's a brilliant introduction to Divine Renovation um, if you'd like to explore that. Um, we have some events coming up, um, which is exciting. Um, this is our next online webinar. It's um, end of April. Um, this is called Putting on the Armour of God. And um, it's about prayer and spiritual battle in parish renewal, because that, th that third key of the power of the Holy Spirit, this is absolutely crucial. If you're thinking about changing confirmation preparation, if you're thinking about changing anything in the parish, um, we shouldn't go into this without a real kind of grounding in prayer. And so we're going to be discussing that with some fantastic guests. I know that's going to be really inspiring. So we'd love to invite you to that in April. And we're really excited that we've got some um, in-person events coming up as well. So I'm going to hand over to Matt for this event because Matt is, in fact, going to be there in person. Yes, uh, I can't even tell you where Salford is, but I can't wait to be there. I know uh, that it's in the UK because it's at one of the parishes that I get the privilege of walking alongside. Uh, at St. James and All Souls Parish there with Father Frankie. Uh, this is an event open to everybody. This is not just for their parish. It's not just for clergy. If you're on this call and you're within 11 hours driving to Salford, that's probably not even possible in the UK, right? Because you'd be in the water. So like uh, if you're close distance or want to make the day of it, we'd love you to come join us for this open house. Because here's the other thing I know about anything we do to renew parishes. When we do it together, when we hear from other people doing it, like these webinars, we see what's possible. We don't feel alone, and it actually energizes us to push through into the hard stuff. So we hope you'll join us for this uh, Saturday, May 14th. Awesome. We're so excited for that. Come and see what this looks like in a parish that's, that's a little bit further down the road, and they're seeing lots of fruit come to Salford. Um, and then for our next event, this is in Winchester. And we have um, a video that we would love to show you, um, which is about this event coming up in Winchester. so much change over the last two years and where lots of change happens we need vision and so what we want to do today is to create a space where we can collectively come together and form vision for parishes post pandemic. That is our event, um, DR Connect. It's happening in Winchester on the 21st of May. Um, and this event really is um, 
for parishes that are using divine renovation principles already. So if you're already on the journey, this Winchester event is for you. If you're not yet on the journey and you want to understand more and see what this looks like, then Salford is the one for you. So choose which one is the best fit for your parish. And we would love to see you at one of those events. You can sign up now. And in fact, um, in an email following this webinar, we're gonna send you links to everything that, that's happening and you can, you can sign up through that email. And then finally, um, we would love to, uh, there's a poll coming up on your, on your screen um, because we would love to connect with you. And perhaps if you are a priest who's joining us today, or if you are not a priest, but you think your priest, your parish priest would be interested in this, we would love to offer you a 15 minute call with somebody from Divine Renovation, a guide, um, to talk about how to move your parish into mission. So if you feel like you've been really inspired by what you've heard today and you think, yes, we need to take some steps in this direction, but we just don't know how to start. Um, um, tick one of those boxes, say yes, you'd like more information or yes, you think your parish priest would be interested. Um, and we will follow up with you. We would love to have a call and um, to hear about your parish, to hear about your journey um, and to, to, to help you think through what the next steps might be. So to click on that poll now um, and then you'll also see as well um, different ways to connect with us as well if you just want to send us an email um, or you can have a look on our website as well which which has more information there so we are right at the end now of our time together it's been so great thank you so much everybody for all of your participation there have been so many inspiring ideas um to hear here um all the questions that 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 are there we're gonna i know that there are unanswered questions so we will try and um connect with you and answer them um after the event as well um but i'd love to end in prayer because as we say um, none of this will change without prayer. So let's pray right now for our parishes and for our young people, because essentially, you know, this is this is for them. We want them to, to know the Lord and to come alive in faith with him. So, um, Matt, I'm just going to hand over to you if you would if you would pray for all of us. I'd be I'd be honored. And I want you all to know tonight when I go to confirmation and I watch my son sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit by our bishop. Um, that I'm bringing our prayers from this group, our, maybe our frustrations, our worry. I want to bring all of that with me tonight. So when I'm there, I know that that same Holy Spirit that showed up in the upper room, that shows up at every confirmation in every person's life is going to hear these prayers. I know this is a hard journey um, and you can't do it alone. The, the power of the Holy Spirit has to be the driver. And then you need to just link arms with each other. Uh, because enough's enough, and the Lord is so ready to see a renewal in the young church, and it can happen. It's possible. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just ask you to send your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in power. Come in truth. Come in boldness. Lord, not as just a, a symbol or a sign or a word, but in a powerful way into our hearts through the person of the Holy Spirit in the relationship that you want to have with us and with every young person who receives the sacrament of confirmation, the outpouring and the sealing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that we beg for those as well, Lord, in our own lives. Because no person that encounters you, Lord, leaves without a job. And we realize, Lord, that you're calling us into mission and you're sending us. So equip us for this mission. Change hearts and minds, Lord, that need to be convicted or convinced that there is another way. And Lord, we pray for every young person in our lives, including those in our own houses, that they would have an encounter with the risen Christ and would grow up to be lifelong believers to raise their families in the faith as well. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's just been such an inspiring conversation. And um, we will see you all next time. Thank you so much. And good night. God bless. <laughs>